Welcome to Slam Day Boston Celtics podcast, where we cover the Boston Celtics and the rest of the NBA. But tonight it is all Celtics. I'm Megan Adelini from WEI, joined as always by Esteban Bustios from GBH and Justin Turpin, also of WEI and Odyssey. You guys are over at TD Garden right now. This is far and away the best playoff game that we've had in a year. I mean, this playoff game between the Celtics and Pacers game one of the Eastern Conference Finals I feel like I have been crawling through the desert and finally I don't know if this is a mirage but it's like there's a watering hole this water uh, my thirst is quenched this is the NBA playoffs that has finally arrived in Boston I just wrote about it for WEI.com I might be overreacting because it's not like the Pacers are anything more than a six seed, but oh my God, was I like waiting for some kind of drama like this? One might call it an oasis. Is that what, is that what yeah, I was I think, looking at? I think that's what it's called. Well, yeah. It was like, it's fake. And I know uh, there'll be mm, a lot a of people word. out there. There'll be a lot of people out there who are saying, you know, it's fake. It's a fraud win, whatever. I'm not saying that. And I'll get to why, but I want to get your guys' initial impressions as you beat there. Yeah, uh, I feel like I need therapy after after this game. Uh, just it, it's, total disclaimer, total just a uh, moment of honesty here. I tried to leave the press box with 10 seconds left because I thought India handed the ball and I was like, oh, they're going to Celtics have to foul. That's pretty much the game up three. Um, and then they turn over and Jalen Brown hits one of the most uh, incredible shots of uh, maybe the most incredible. Well, I'd say the only other shot this playoffs that it tops this is probably Jamal Murray's half quarter uh, earlier in the series against the Timberwolves uh, for for Denver. But wow, what a what a uh, complete script turn! I mean, if they had lost, the I, it would have been like the book of Revelation in here in the Boston sports landscape. But this win, um, uh, the, how clutch they were in overtime! Um, wow. Uh, could not have been more of a of a script reverse for for Boston tonight. I think you put it perfectly. Just wow, that's that's the perfect way to sum this one up. I mean, it felt like they were dead in the water. I mean, people were heading towards the exits. I saw a video so circling on social media where the people that left are watching the game through the windows of bars. Like, it was pretty cool, and we were due for if one I, of these classic games. If I was the bartender or you know the manager, I would have gone up and shut the shades. I'd be like, you left. You don't get to look in here. And by the way, you don't, to look at, you don't get to look at my TVs for free. You better come in here and buy a drink, okay? You left that. You left that game. That was I a just close game all the way through. That's ridiculous of you. And Easter <laughs> Conference Finals, I, you can't leave that early. But look what Reggie Miller did with this team. I mean, what are we doing? You got to stick around. But, I mean, what a finish. And like you said, that just the narratives, everything surrounding this team, like everyone's wondering if they're battle-tested. They show that they're up for the challenge there. Your two best players came through and it mattered most in the clutch. It was Jalen Brown, obviously, single-handedly forcing overtime with the big poke away that got them the ball back and setting up his corner three. And then Jason Tatum exploding for 10 in the overtime period. I mean, that's what you need. You need your best players to be the best at that time. And that's exactly what the Celtics got. Megan, right. so, uh, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, just, I was just going to yeah, say it was obviously exciting here to see the shot from Brown. What was it like hearing the double bang from Mike Breen at home? I got to say it was a nice moment because Breen overall, I don't know if you guys saw this on Twitter or anything. He was having a little bit of a tough night. I don't know, like, if it was because of the sound. He at one point said it's so hard to hear the whistle in here. So I think he was really, this like, struggling. Sad. Okay, well, he he was, like, <laughs> he seemed a little bit lost at times on the broadcast, to be honest. I was watching at home tonight. Uh, but, yeah, so that was great in the moment. I will say my biggest takeaway from this game is what you just said, Terp, which is, you finally got a clutch moment from Jason Tatum. And it wasn't just that he needed that in this night where he was pretty cold through the fourth and then had that overtime clutch moment that he had, obviously following the savior moment from Jalen Brown. But for Jason Tatum, he's been chasing that for pretty much the entire year. He's been chasing that in the regular season, as we've talked about and I've written about. These clutch shooting moments for him have been so far and few between. I don't care if it's a six seed. I don't care if they're playing lackluster defense like I heard Scal talking about on the postgame show. Like, whatever. 
there have been so many times when those guys have not been able to step up to the moment. And tonight they did that. And I'm just going to celebrate that for a little bit. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, I guess my question for y'all, uh, what do you think? Because they had leads of 12, the Celtics had leads of 12, leads of 13. Um, is it concerning to y'all that they weren't able to expand that out? I know Missoula himself said, like, look, you can't expect just to to go on runs uh, all the time and be able to stretch that out because they knew the Pacers are going to get on their own run. Um is it, is it concerning to y'all that this was uh, even as, as close of a game as it was, given how overpowering the Celtics look at times uh, in this game? I would say just really quick from the jump turp, like a 12-point game, a 14-, 15-point game is not what it was 10 years ago. In look the, at Game like, 7 with like, the Wolves. Yeah, you know, like we we all recognize that, that the right. direction that the offenses have gone in. Um, we've talked about a lot in our podcast during the regular season. That is a is a less safe lead than it was 10 years ago. So I still look at this and I go, they had 10 different lead changes in this game. It was tied, I think, like six different times. This was a back and forth where I think the Celtics really needed this. And I understand that it sounds like um, – I'm, I'm being soft on them because it's like, oh, you just want them to roll over opponents. And uh, they this was their home court and they should have been showing up and, you know, just doing what they did in the first three and a half minutes of the game where they were up 12-0. But I think that it's more instructive for this team going forward to be in these situations. Yeah, and I think it actually says a lot about the Celtics. As much as it says something about Indiana for them, especially from that early run, the crowd was into it. They respond, and they kept on responding. I think what the Celtics built, three or four 10-plus point leads, and every single time Indiana responded. But I also think that says something about the Celtics because in years past, when things got tough, they'd roll, roll over and quit. They would just give up. They're like, years all right, past, How about ser series pass? Right? Even series pass, right. Like <laughs> you know, like just, if you think about the yeah. two games that they've lost in these playoffs, it was basically the equivalent of them being like, well, it's not going to be tonight. I think that was the rough, case guys. in game two at Cleveland. I don't think that was the case in Miami just because of the ridiculous volume of three-point shots that they made. I think that was a little bit different. But I'm with you. Like they, in years past, would have just given up when they see like, all right, here they come. They're coming storming back. And instead, the Celtics kept on answering. And shout out to Jason Tatum, too, because you mentioned his clutch shots, and we've been talking about that all year. I know you've written a ton of stuff about it for WEI.com. And he missed that shot in overtime with 10 seconds left. And that was the one that, that was felt like the nail in the coffin for the Celtics. They ended up getting obviously coming back and winning. But Tatum didn't shy away from shooting after that. He didn't let it break his confidence, and I think that's something that's going to be overlooked because everyone's. if he didn't explode in the overtime period, everyone would have been talking about, oh, here we go, Tatum can't get it done in the clutch again. But he did He did step it up. So I think tonight just shows a lot of growth from Celtics and the fact that they know now they're not going to completely eliminate runs. It's a natural part of the game, especially when you're talking about a Pacers team with such a high-octane offense that can just put up points in bunches. They're one of the most efficient offenses in NBA history. They're going to score. They're going to go on those runs. And like you mentioned, 12-point leads are nothing because of the way offenses is, are right. now. And the Celtics learned that tonight, and they they understand that. I think Joe Mazzula is really clear in that. And as long as they just continue to stay the course and do what they're doing, it's just a matter of weathering that storm. And I think the Celtics did a good job at that tonight. Esteban, I think we have gone too long on this podcast because uh, there's been so many things that we're extolling and we just sound like a bunch of fanboys and fangirl, but whatever. It's a fun night. Yeah, yeah. Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday, this is why you brought this guy in. I know there were certain points yeah. of the season where I heard people say, like, Drew Holiday, you know who he looks a lot like? Marcus Smart. And they weren't saying that in the way that I talked about Marcus Smart. They were saying it in a, in a less derogatory way. Right, yeah. right. But Drew Holiday tonight, 28 points. Uh, eight, I think he finished with eight assists. I'm going to double check that number. Yes. Yeah, that's where he was eight at. Assists, yeah. But the impact that he had along with Jalen Brown on defense, like there were points of this game where their defense was very lackluster. But when they got down the stretch and the pressure that he was putting on Halliburton as a ball handler, yeah. and then also uh, the contributions he was making on offense, this was down the stretch, like such a composed performance from Drew Holiday. And that's why you bring in a guy who has won before and who is 33, right. even though he's a, you know, kind of undersized point guard. 
Yeah, I don't know if y'all heard Halliburton's comments after the game, but he was like, yeah, like this guy has been the best defender in the league. I, be- I believe that was his term, best defender in the league uh, for a long time. Obviously, uh, that that's known. Uh, again, offensively for Holiday, 10 of 16 from the field, 4 of 8 from 3, 4 of 4 uh, from 3 throw. I mean, uh, Jalen Brown himself said he's the reason we uh, the, the Celtics won tonight. Uh, I agree. If uh, if he if there's a game MVP trophy, I think that goes to Holiday. Obviously, uh, Tatum has a great game, but just all the things that Holiday did um, on both sides of the floor, hitting some threes when the Celtics were not really great as a whole from beyond the arc tonight, um, and consistently again perfect from from beyond the arc. Um, that was a huge boost uh, for Boston. And again, we've. We've sort of beat this. It's it's a, it's a dead horse at this point, but just that on any given night, one of these guys who's not Tatum or Brown can and almost you know, it seems like almost will explode. Um, and especially with Porzingis still, you know, somewhere here deep within the caverns of TD Garden rehabbing. Uh, they they need that. They need that. And and uh, yeah, that's what a what a fantastic performance from him. He's really been big ever since game three in Cleveland. He's just found his groove, especially offensively. And they needed that, like you said, with Kristaps Porzingis out. But you look at it, the guy flirts with a triple-double tonight. And on the defensive end, he's harassing Tyrese Halliburton. And one of the biggest plays of the night was when he forced the ball. He literally forced Tyrese Halliburton to dribble the ball into Mike Breen. Right where I'm sitting, right here. He forced him to dribble it. That's impressive. And you look at it like Halliburton, yeah, he had, what, 20 25 points but he took him 18 shots to get there that's really not that efficient we'll that's, see yeah the that, numbers that, that's tomorrow what, right that's what you would get that that's what uh, you want if you're boston like 100 percent. yeah and he was yeah. just nails on both ends of the, the floor and he's been doing it all year i think it's just more now evident because the stage is bigger but he's really been consistent all year maybe not obviously 20 or 28 points whatever he had tonight the uh, the season is a season high for him, so we haven't seen this level of scoring, but he's been doing this on both ends of the floor, and he's been unbelievably consistent all year long. And the game winning assist to, to Brown in the corner. Right. That That's a great point. Exactly that was, a, where that was an go. awesome pass. This is where I'd say Drew Holiday, if I'm looking at this in a very talk radio kind of way, of saying, is this a team, or is this a win rather, that a game that the Celtics won? or that the Pacers lost, you know, who ultimately was in control of most of this game and either threw it away or just let somebody come in, or was it the Celtics taking control? I do think Drew Holiday is the agent of control that allows you to say the Celtics took over this game. It's not just the Pacers being uncomposed because those things like Drew Holiday's pressure on Halliburton, Drew Holiday inbounding the bow, having that connection with Jalen Brown, being able to see it. They said that's just the way they drew it up. Uh, Jalen Brown says he was wide open. I mean, not really by the time he got the ball because Siakam's, you know, in his face to the point that yeah. he's falling over as he's shooting. And Drew Holiday, to me, like, that's the best way that I can illustrate the difference that he makes on this team. It's not, people will say this tomorrow, it is not that the Pacers just threw it away and choked. He made that happen for them. Yeah, I like that that nickname, Agents of Control. It's like it's the opposite of what the Joker calls himself in the Dark Knight. Remember, he's like, <laughs> I'm an agent of chaos. This is uh, yeah. Drew Holiday's Batman. He may be uh, the Boston Batman. <laughs> Probably you? the opposite of what a lot of people would describe Marcus Smart in those situations yeah. as well. Hey, <laughs> he doesn't need to catch strays right he now. He doesn't, I, but, but we're just so we're being I, real. I want to yeah. ask you guys um, if you have seen this yet, because you're over there, and I saw this on the broadcast immediately after Jalen Brown was having a uh, walk-off interview with Lisa Salters from ESPN, where he's talking about, hey, this is what happened with the inbound play with Drew Holiday and that shot and all of it. And he's talking repeatedly about how they have to be better. A, a lot of the guys said that post game. it seems, that they weren't pleased with their performance overall. But he said, we had some momentum plays and JT finally woke up. <laughs> I got to ask you guys just really quick. What's the ruling? Is that a shout out or a call out? Shout out or a call out? I think it's uh, there's a, a thing in the Bible called speaking the truth in love. And I think that's what that is. It's just okay. like. He, it's I, the I, most Texan answer in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think <laughs> that that's that's what he was doing. He was like, he, I think he was just keeping it as as, as real as he as he could. Uh, but being honest, which is like a good thing. And he, it's not wrong. Right. Like 
Um, Tatum, as 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 Terp pointed out, had a fantastic overtime. Um, and again, like on a night win, it's weird because like on the one hand, he struggled pretty uh, significantly from three, uh, but he did everything else pretty good, uh, you know, offensively. Um, not to mention some really great plays uh, defensively, but getting to the line uh, in overtime where he was perfect, uh, hitting that big three uh, again on, on a night where he wasn't uh, he wasn't doing great. And, uh, you know, when it mattered most, he hit his shots and he navigated uh, the the defense the way he wanted to. So, yeah, that was a, a I think I think he was right. Yeah, I don't think he was wrong at all. And Jalen hasn't shied Turf. away from uh, shout out or call out. Uh, it was a call out, I think. But it, <laughs> that leads me to my point, though, because like Jalen, again, I can't I keep saying his name. I feel bad because I keep giving him strays, but this isn't necessarily a stray. Marcus, okay. Mark, when he left, it was the kind of he was the one that kept them accountable publicly to the media all honest. the time. He was the one that kept them honest. He was the one that would publicly announce what they did wrong. He would keep them honest, keep the hold them accountable. And when he left, the somebody needs to fill that void. And Jalen Brown has slid right in there. We and saw he was it in Jaylen's both of their guy, games. So. Yeah, exactly. And we saw it in both of these game two losses this year, where he was not afraid to call them out. We need to be better at this. This needs to be better. Our defense was lazy, whatever it may be. He's not afraid to hold them accountable. And I think they know that he is really adapted into this leader, and he's not afraid to call out his teammates. He's not afraid to speak his mind, and especially. Most of the time when he's right, you know, he he's very smart when it comes to basketball IQ. So I don't I think it was a call out and I think it was well deserved from Tatum. He wasn't good at one point. He was what two of eight in the fourth quarter. And then he did finally wake up. So I don't there's no lies detected, as one might say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I can I ask you just real quick? I know I know we're, we're trying to, to get out quickly on the subject of, OK, what could they do better? What did y'all see that you want Boston to improve? I think for me, one of the first things that comes up to mind. Um, figure out what how you're gonna what you're gonna do with Miles Turner because in the first half he was just scorching them. He was a monster. Uh, yeah, uh, and it's it, again this is like part of what happens when Porzingis is out is it's it's a lot harder to switch on, on a guy like that. But I think that's one of the big keys. Uh, he kind of kept them, uh, you know, consistently in, offensively in the game in that first half. I think you gotta try to figure that that matchup out. Um, I think that's probably one of my big things for them going forward. I agree. I think I think we're kind of reaching the threshold of how far you can go without Porzingis in a in a real way because you cannot put Cornet on <laughs> Turner. That was a mismatch from hell uh, when when Cornet was forced to play defense on him. And Al Horford, he, he was he had some big plays down the stretch defensively, but he looked tired at points, and that's just again you know, him being human and almost 38 years old. So, you know, I know that Celtics are trying to keep kind of an air of mystery around exactly when Porzingis is coming back and exactly what he's doing in his rehab process. But I think it would uh, be smart for them. It would help them a whole lot if they could have him back in game four. You know, you game four would be a great time. Yeah, and you know where I'm probably going to, you guys know where I'm probably going to go with this in the meantime. Oh, Tillman? The X-Men. Did, you have, a, did, you, have any, did you have any notes on why he was out for personal he, reasons? He lost his dad over the weekend. Oh, that's so, awful. Yeah, ter- oh. yeah, terrible. He's only 25. That's terrible. He's a young dude. But yeah, when he comes back and obviously take his time with that, but whenever he does come back, this could yeah. be an opportunity for him where – this is they they could play smaller and he's a better floor spacer in my opinion than Cornet when he's knocking down those corner threes which is so important for his game but I think this is a series that we could see him we knew going into the playoffs that it was going to be a matchup based thing whether we see Cornet or Tillman and I think this is a series that we could see Tillman especially if the one the Celtics want to go a little bit smaller. Yeah, yeah, I think it it's it makes me a little bit frustrated that in some of these series, we said this at the end of the Heat series, Terp, when we were sitting in the press box together, uh, and during the Cavs series, that you didn't get to see the Celtics go a little bit smaller, you know, right. try rolling out these different small ball lineups. But whatever, that's done, <laughs> you know. And, and one more thought on that: I don't think at this point, if we haven't seen any Tatum at the five, I. You're don't not going see to it this postseason there. It's not something you can just go to in the postseason. So I don't think we're ever going to see that. So all the Celtics Twitter folks that are all over that, we could probably lay that to rest. I want to, I want to make one more note here. Um, this is extremely serious. 
I accused Drake May of being uh, a curse on the garden as a fan because he previously went to a Bruins game that they lost uh, last week. And he was at the Celtics game tonight and it was starting to look like it was going that way. I want to make this note about Drake May, which I think is really important. Um, the I don't know if it was the Celtics exactly, but someone gifted him, I'm guessing it is, gifted him like a custom Celtics yeah, jersey that was the Celtics. with yeah. May on the back. I noticed because somebody I was sitting with pointed it out to me. I have to give credit where credit is due. In the fourth quarter, that when Drake May was standing up, he was wearing a Tatum jersey. So he had swapped out, you know, he wore the little or held up the little custom jersey. But I thought that that was a real boss move, you know, to put on the real Tatum jersey yeah. and not walk around like I your, didn't catch uh, that. like your Max Struess or somebody, you know. That well, that may have been. I don't know if you saw that Tatum signed a, I believe a Tatum jersey for him pregame. So that may have been the one that that he gave. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's all. Coming I saw the together. little video between them. It was adorable. I yeah. know we already had a ruling on the show, but I just one more ruling: customized jerseys with your last name. I'm no. out. Totally out. No, no. Totally, totally out. out. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 page. if the Celtics if it, are giving it to you, that's one thing. But if oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If you're going and making it yourself, please, please don't. <laughs> yeah, save, save <laughs> please think it. Please reconsider. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think that wraps it up for tonight. Um, really awesome. Thank you for letting me jump in with you guys there at the garden, and uh, hopefully we'll have more exciting games like this because I feel like it's just been you know. You guys know how I felt. It's just been like a slow march towards the finals for some real real drama. But I think this this series might have a little more juice than we expected. It better. I mean, they're here for a reason. It's the Eastern Conference Finals. <laughs> it's fun. Okay, it's well, fun. this is slammed. We'll have more episodes as the series goes on. So find us wherever you find your podcast or on YouTube. Thanks, guys. <laughs>